Hey everybody, in the last episode of Shop Talk, which I've linked to below in the description, I laid out an opinion which was not well received. So I wanted to take some time and walk through my thinking a little more cogently than I was able to during the episode. Here's the short version. When you create a table and need a string column, you have a couple options available. Varchar and Invarchar. The far too short, simplifying things because I don't want to spend the entire video explaining it and all the gory details difference, is that Varchar is an 8-bit data type which stores characters based on a collation, whereas Invarchar is a 16-bit data type which stores Unicode formatted data, UTF-16 in particular. There's a lot more to that story, and I've got a link if you want to dive into that. But for this story, it's Prelude. Let's say you're a developer creating a table to store the string data. Do you choose varchar or invarchar? The classic answer is, it depends. Let me talk about why that is. On the one hand, invarchar allows you to use the entire Unicode range of characters. This is great if the person wants to enter data using characters which do not appear in your coalition's code page. As an example, let's say you're storing customer names and your collation is the default for a US-based install. If you want to store customer names as varchar, you can easily store most Western names in there. But if somebody wants to put in the name of someone in Chinese, Japanese, Hebrew, Arabic, Korean, or any of the other languages not supported in this code page, it's transliteration or bust. Change that to invarchar and now you can store everybody's name. On the other hand, invarchar is a 16-bit data type, meaning that a single character will be either 2 or 4 bytes. With varchar, single byte character sets are worth 1 byte per character, though you can have double byte characters in varchar with certain Asian languages. And with UTF-8 support in SQL Server 2019, it can range from 1 to 4 bytes. For the sake of simplicity, let's assume all your varchar characters are single byte and varchar characters are 2 bytes. After all, the exact math doesn't change the story very much. So with this trade-off in mind, there are four possible camps. Camp 1, only use varchar. Prior to SQL Server 2019, you're basically saying anyone who never had to deal with internationalization. If you're running solo projects or you know the complete set of users and there's no need for Unicode, I can understand this camp. But for projects of pretty much any significance, you gotta leave that area. Camp 2, Default to Varchar, use invarchar only when necessary. There are a lot of good people in this camp, especially in the Western world. Camp three, default to invarchar, but use varchar when you know you don't need Unicode. It's a fairly popular group as well, and outside of this thought experiment, I'd probably end up here. But let's try living in camp four, invarchar everywhere. Let me tell you why this is the place to be. So the first problem, Ask a product owner, will this column ever contain Unicode data? And the answer is probably not reliable. So what do we as developers do? We guess, yeah, probably is not gonna contain Unicode, so let's make it Varchar. Sometimes we guess wrong. Even if you are an entirely US-based company, you've probably still got non-Western customers, suppliers, or users somewhere. And the question is, how much do you want to support those people? Are they trying to use your systems now and getting mangled data because your Varchar columns didn't support their input? In Varchar Everywhere has an easy answer to that. You don't need to ask the product owner because you use Unicode for all columns. We also don't need to worry about converting columns and systems later on to be Unicode compatible. We built that up front. This helps us with the second problem, implicit conversion. Implicit conversion between varchar and invarchar data can be a nightmare, leading to unexpected table scans and poor performance. Having to keep in mind which columns are varchar and which invarchar, making sure you don't try to join them together, is a mental burden for developers. It may be a small mental burden, but it's one more thing they have to think about when writing code, and one more area where things can go wrong. But if you come on down to camp invarchar everywhere, you don't even have to think about that. When everything is in Varchar, you have one pattern to follow. You don't need to think about stored procedure variable mismatch or performance degradation from implicit conversion problems. So let me tell you what camps in Varchar sometimes and in Varchar most of the time will say in response to my heresy. They'll say, yeah, that's great and all, 
but you are burning so much storage with all this extraneous Invarchar nonsense. Let's take a look at how bad it really is in this demo. In this demo, we're going to look at how Varchar and Invarchar columns compare in terms of space utilization. I'm going to start out with a test table that has a couple of Varchar columns on it. We also have a clustered index and a non-clustered index on one of the string columns, just to make it fancy. Let's run this. Then I'll do the same thing but every Varchar column is now in Varchar. That way we have a test to compare against. First example that I'll walk through is inserting straight ASCII characters. So 150 copies of the letter A, 30 copies of the letter X, and we'll get 100,000 of them in total. So let's do that for our test table, and then we'll do that for our Unicode based table, and then I'm going to call the SP space used stored procedure to compare the sizes of these two tables. So as I run this, we're going to get back the answer that the invarchar tables are almost twice as big as the varchar tables. This is pretty similar to what we talked about during the last segment. There is a difference. And you know, that's a pretty significant storage difference over time with enough columns. So what I'd like to do is walk through a couple of other scenarios uh, before we get a better understanding of how we can mitigate this problem. Second, I wanna figure out what is, what is the size of a mouse and what is the size of a banjo? And in case you're ever asked these in a job interview, it turns out that the correct answer for the size of a mouse and the size of a banjo is four bytes. Uh, so both of them are exactly the same size, just like in real life. We're going to populate a table full of mice and banjos. As I mentioned, these are four byte characters, which means that for an invarchar 150 column, we get 300 bytes of space available to us. We have four bytes taken up per mouse, so I can only insert 75 mice compared to 150 two-byte letter A's, or letters A, if you will. So I'm going to run this, truncate the table, insert my mice and banjos, and check the size. The size is going to be exactly the same because we filled out both tables to capacity. So 40K, 36K of indexes, still a lot of space used compared to the Varchar version. But you'll notice I don't have a Varchar example because I can't insert a mouse into that table. So if my business case involves inserting mice, I'm already out of luck. Continuing on, what happens if, you know, we don't insert a mouse for every value? What if we have letters and mice? or letters and banjos. I can insert 148 characters plus my mouse. 28 X's plus a banjo for the invarchar 30 column. So I'll truncate insert and we'll check the space used once more. Running this, nothing has changed. You know, it's still exactly the same as it was before and I can check the data length of the first row. All of the rows will be exactly the same, so checking the first one is just, uh, sub it's a simplicity measure. Here we go, 150 bytes for my Varchar table, 300 bytes for my mouseified in Varchar table. There's the mouse at the end. But what happens if I use row level compression? Now things get interesting. I'm going to rebuild all of the indexes on this test table with row level compression. Then I'm going to truncate the data and reload it because if I don't do it, let me show you what happens. If I just run SP space used right now. This is an unfair comparison because I rebuilt in test table, but I did not rebuild test table. And so the sizes are going to be a little different. Uh, unfair comparison. 
So to make it fair, we are going to truncate the table, reinsert our data, and run space used again. So instead of 20,560 kilobytes, we're going to get 22,000K. So a little bit larger than the Varchar version, but you know we're talking a couple of megabytes over 100,000 rows. That's not that significant. At this point, it's the same size, essentially. Except that I get fancy mice and banjos in my table now. If I do another check of data length with row level compression, nothing changed. The data length to display all of these uh, values is still exactly the same. The mouse didn't suddenly become two bytes or something just because it's compressed. So it still takes 300 bytes to display all of this data. So let's go to the next demo. We're gonna really mix it up here. 50,000 rows with a mouse, 50,000 rows without a mouse. And what I want you to understand is, as we go back to space used, I have 22224 as the value here. And I wanna see if row level compression has a bonus for entire rows that are just Unicode strings that are, that are ASCII compatible, or if Unicode compression doesn't help us out more for this type of data set than this type of data set. So we wanna see if 22224 is our answer. And if I run this, we actually do get a small benefit. So the rows that only have ASCII data can be compressed even further using Unicode compression than the rows that have a mouse or a banjo in them. And with that, let's go back to our main story. We can see from the demo that if we use row level compression, we can store Unicode data in a more compact fashion to the point where if everybody enters ASCII data, the difference is negligible, yet we're still protected when we switch to Unicode. This does come at a slight CPU cost, but my experience is it's slight enough that I generally default to row level compression for all of my string based indexes anyhow, and frankly, I'll use page on a lot. But wait, the other camp members will say, you only showed us fixed length data. Tell me what happens with the max data types. Well, okay, let's go back to the demo. This time around, we're going to look at a table with Invarchar max columns instead of our previous table that had lengths of 150 and 30 characters, respectively. Note that you cannot use Invarchar max as the key column in an index. It can be part of the include, but it can't be a key column. So I could not create that non-clustered index. Also note, I am pre-creating this table with data compression set to row, so I'm not going to walk through that part of the demo again. We will create this table, and first up, do the same insert statement that we've done before. So 100,000 rows of A's and mice and X's and banjos, and I'll compare the two in Varchar tables. When there's no overflow, we can see that, oh, yeah, this table is a bit larger. Row level compression is not helping us out. Unicode compression does not work for Invarchar Max at all, even if all of the data fits onto the page. However, we can rebuild this with page level compression. In addition to Unicode and row level compression, page level compression gives us a few other techniques for building out a dictionary to reduce the size of each uh, page. So I can run this, and because all of the data is actually sitting on pages, it doesn't have to go out to overflow or to lob, we get a nice benefit. So it goes from 40k or 40 megabytes used to 1.8 megabyte used. That's not too bad. I'll take that. Now, to be fair, I'm going to see the same exact benefit if I rebuild my test table that's not in Varchar Max. 
we run this and yeah, it's a little bit different, but I wouldn't worry too much about the exact differences in size. Uh, it's probably related to the differences in the data that we've inserted. So from here, what we're going to do is truncate the lob table. And this time around, I'm going to remove compression and insert enough data that it fits, fills up the page and overflows. So let's run this. And now this is 160 megabytes reserved. We've got quite a bit of data utilization, but hey, I taught you about page level compression. So let's run this and we'll see that it has dropped all the way to, well, exactly the same size as before. Page level compression only works on pages, does not compress lob data. So this overflow example is not going to be compressed. That means if you have in Varchar Max and it does actually need Max instead of fitting in, say, in Varchar 4000, then you're gonna have some trouble because you will have to eat the full cost of storage. With that note, let's go back to our main event. Ah, here it doesn't look so great for camp in Varchar everywhere. If you have max length attributes and data spills over into lob and you know that you will never use Unicode, compression won't mitigate the size difference. But for the type of thing where you're storing rather lengthy descriptions of items, strings of more than 4,000-ish Unicode characters, are you sure there will never be any internationalization project necessitating you eventually go to Invarchar Max? because those are the nastiest columns to convert later on down the road. As I wrap this up, I wanna hit on the strengths and weaknesses of InVarchar everywhere. First, the weaknesses, so they're completely out in the open. InVarchar max columns with overflow to lob will be larger than their Varchar counterparts. And short of switching the data type to var binary and using the compress function, there's not much we can do about it. Second, if your max data length is between 4001 and 8000 characters, you know the column will never have Unicode characters and the data is highly compressible. You will save a lot of space with Varchar plus page level compression. Whereas in this zone, you need to use InVarchar max and therefore you lose out on compression. Third problem, with InVarchar plus compression, you may take a small performance hit versus equivalent uncompressed Varchar data. But frankly, that's a maybe problem. Quite often, I.O. benefits from compression will outweigh those CPU costs. Now let's look at the strengths. First, you will never have implicit conversion again. There is no data type conversion here. All of your app devs will know to use Unicode. All of your stored procedure parameters use InVarchar data types. String to string joins, to the extent that you do that, will always be between InVarchar types. Second, there is no risk of data loss due to somebody trying to store Unicode data in a Varchar column. That is, no weird question marks showing that your code page doesn't know what your user was talking about. Third, you never need to refactor those Varchar columns later on when you found out that, oh, you do have to deal with Unicode. Fourth, this is one less thing you need to think about when designing a database. If all your string columns are in Varchar, you don't even need to ask the question. I hope you enjoyed this thought experiment. I won't say I'm a strict adherent to camp in Varchar everywhere, but I did enjoy diving into the idea a bit. But what do you think? I'd love to hear your feedback. Do you agree with camp in Varchar everywhere or am I way off base here? Let me know in the comments below. In the meantime, until the next time we meet, take care.